What I want to talk with you about tonight is why I'm not home in Vermont, and why I've been on the road more than I've, more than I've been home um, the last few years and things, and it's because the thing that's going to derail that, the thing that's going to prevent us from having that kind of world, the thing that we've got to pay attention to right alongside making sure that our own place is beautiful. The thing we got to do besides conserving the Metau Valley is conserving the whole planet in some way that allows that dream to keep developing. Because none of that's going to have a chance at the rate that things are going on this planet as a whole. My pleasure, one of them at, at home, is being on the board of the Adirondack Conservancy. I spent much of my life in the Adirondack Mountains of upstate New York, and getting to preserve land and, and make things better for the future is the, is the nicest possible thing. And Vermont is a place very much like where I live now, very much like this valley, it seems to me. Not, not, the peaks aren't quite as high. Um, uh, you guys don't have the advantage of black flies and things, but um, but um, um, very much the very much the same. And and what's so exciting in these places is to see them not just being preserved, but getting steadily better in all kinds of ways. Over the last decade of this local food movement, of which so many people here are part, is one of the great, inspiring, beautiful stories of our time. Um, the fastest growing part of our food economy for 15 years has been the farmer's market. Uh, and it comes with all kinds of great promise. You know, if you put a strip of pH paper in the ocean, it comes out a different color, and as you know from your neighbors to the west along the coast, it's already making it very difficult for creatures low on the marine food chain to form their shells and do the things that are required to keep that ecosystem underway. We learned last Tuesday in an absolutely gut-wrenching pair of papers from science and from geophysical research letters, um, it turns out that the West Antarctic ice sheet sits in a geological bowl and that that bowl is now filling up with warm water, seawater from below that's leaking in and their conclusion was that we're now past the point of no return, though it may take some decades or centuries for or century for all of it to melt. That melt is now underway and that's another 10 feet or so of sea level rise on top of that which we had already feared. Those images of fire from Southern California looked like something illustration out of the Book of Revelations. Um, it, was, um, it was powerful, but something like that is happening every day on this planet now at the same time that they're in record drought in California, what we see flooding and rainfall of uh, extreme levels like we've never seen before. Each day we trap the heat equivalent of about 400,000 Hiroshima-sized bombs. And that extra heat is what's melting the Arctic and the Antarctic and doing all these other things. That's with one degree Celsius increase in temperature. The same scientists who told us that would happen tell us that we are on trajectory at the moment for someplace between four and six degrees rise in temperature in the lifetime of the youngest people in this room. And if that happens, then we cannot have a civilization like the one that we are used to having. It is necessary to have carbon carry a price that reflects the damage it does in the atmosphere. This is the simplest possible thing we could do, but it hasn't happened because it would cut into the massive amounts of money that these guys made. <coughs> Everywhere you are, in Winthrop or in Warsaw, you know, you get this it has same <coughs> meaning. So we set to work. Um, our great advantage was that there were seven of us, and there are seven continents, so each one took one. Um, <laughs> um, 
the guy who got the Antarctic also had to do the internet. Um, um, off we went. I want to show you just a few, because I know that you guys are all engaged in this fight, and basically what I want you to see are who your brothers and sisters around the world are. One of the things I had always heard was that environmentalism was something that rich white people did, and if you didn't know where your next meal was coming from, you wouldn't be an environmentalist, and so on and so forth, and it turned out within minutes or hours of watching these pictures stream in, sometimes 30 and 40 a minute, that it was very clear what nonsense this was. Most of the people that we were working with around the world were poor and black and brown and Asian and young because that's what most of the world consists of. And what do you know, they're exactly as interested in the future as anybody else, maybe more so because the future bears down pretty hard on you in these places. And they showed remarkable creativity. Uh, so we keep doing this kind of education. We've done we think 20,000 or so rallies all over the world um, in the last four years. Every country except North Korea. Um, and it's been beautiful and fun and, and, and completely inspiring to, to me. I mean, places I'd never heard of, places we'd heard of in other contexts. Um, but you need to know the scale and the pace of the problem if you're going to seriously address the scale and the pace of the necessary solutions, okay? Because otherwise we just end up waving our hands and doing small things that don't amount to a hill of beans in the face of it all. 